don't know me, my name is Mary Ann Savakinis. I'm the director of the Historical Society, and we are delighted today to have our um, our partner from Luzerne County Historical Society, Mark Rossetti, is with us. Um, he's going to talk all about 1860s baseball. I understand it's two words at that time. Um, but Mark is a, a native of Plains, Pennsylvania, and he attended local uh, elementary and high schools there in Wilkes-Barre before he received his bachelor's in history from Indicott College of Beverly, Massachusetts. He was one of the first five students to help create the history program there and was the first to receive the history degree from that institution. After graduating, he returned to the Wyoming Valley to pursue his career in the history field, first working for the Anthracite Heritage Museum up here in Scranton, as well as its satellite sites at Eckley and the Iron Furnaces, and then joined the Luzerne County Historical Society in 2007 becoming the full-time director of operations in 2011. Mark's focus on this is on the study of American history, especially the American Revolution, the American Civil War, and of course, the history of the Wyoming Valley. In addition to handling the day-to-day -day operating of the Luzerne County Historical Society, Mark gives lectures, helps researchers, and sets up exhibits, plans and promotes events, and gives tours both regular and as a living historian. Uh, he is uh, especially fond of working at the Swetland Homestead in Wyoming and the Nathan Dennison House in Forty Fort. Um, Mark's other interests include, uh, now I wanna get it right, classic automobiles. He can be found working on his latest car or hanging out at the racetrack when he's not reading or researching for a new exhibit or a reenactment rule. He recently retired from a competition in drag racing and comp competed in races sanctioned by the NHRA, the IHRA, the MANDRA, the SBRA, the SCCA, and Formula Rotex sanctioning bodies. Um, since 2012, he's been married to Ann Leesman. They live here in Northeastern Pennsylvania, and we're very happy to have Mark with us today to tell us a little bit about the history of baseball. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you. As Mariana said, is on baseball in the 19th century, uh, focused around 1860, uh, and the reason for that we'll talk about a little bit later, mostly because that was the first real set of widely available codified rules, uh, but we're going to go a little bit in the back, a little bit forward. Uh, this is the Elysian Fields. This is where the Knickerbockers really codified the original game. It's a nice little postcard there. It's a pretty famous one you could buy at the Hall of Fame. So, like I said, it's going to be just an overview. Literal books have been written on this. Ken Burns, uh, his documentary with the new part, I believe, is at 26 and a half hours, which is a great documentary. If you haven't seen it, I, I totally recommend it. Uh, we're going to start in the 1790s. We're going to go to around 1868. The reason why you stop specifically at 1868 is that is when uh, the first professional team started the Cincinnati Red Stockings, and that really was when they considered the game to be ruined because it was supposed to be a gentleman's game. You never were supposed to be paid. You never were supposed to cheat. Um, of course, now it looks like one of the cheating teams is going to go to the World Series again. So, hey, everything old is new. Um, I'll talk about the founding of the game. We're talking about some of the equipment. It's hard to see on Zoom, but I have my 1860s glove on. Uh, we're going to discuss the rules. We're going to focus on the differences. And everything you see here is in compliance with the VBBA, one of the other many organizations that I'm a member of, is the Vintage Baseball, two words, association, uh, which sanctions leagues across the country played by uh, proper rules, if you will. So we talked about 1816, it's, 1860 rather, it's pretty much a midpoint, but it's also a very fascinating year in baseball. The game is recognizable enough that if you were to watch a game and when we don't have COVID-19, we have often held games at the Sweatland Homestead that people have attended and you can sit and you can watch it and you can follow along. It's, it's baseball, it's recognizable. But at the same time, it's different enough to be fairly radical and to make you sit back and go, huh, okay. Uh, you all, 1860 was also the first year that the first national convention of the NABBP took place, which was the National Association of Baseball Players, which was neither national nor made up of players. 
and actually was a New York group of teams that formed this and just called themselves a national organization. Uh, the rule book is available unedited. Of course, as I say that, my, at least for me, my window is covering it, but that's Beatles Dime Ball Player. Uh, it is the official 1860 rule book of the game. You can find this online for free. I have a link at the end of this slideshow. Usually when I do this live, I actually hand out copies. But if you just type in Beatles Dime Ball Player 1860, you can find the entire PDF available for free. You also have the very first uh, box scores. You know, when you even today you go to a Rail Riders game, they always tell you, hey, score that play. Scoring the game as we know it came to be. This is from a New York paper in 1860. And this is actually a box score of a game that took place with a report. Uh, cor the correct score of a baseball match. And again, two words, even in 1860. So 1860 is a great jumping off point. Now, when I do this live, this is usually when I ask the crowd, who founded baseball? Who invented baseball? And somebody inevitably says Abner Doubleday. And I go, no. So uh, it was an Abner Doubleday. That's Abner. The Doubleday myth was created in 1908, over 100 years after the game of baseball as we know it came around. And it was Albert Goodwood Spaulding, who, of course, made uh, the Spaulding Athletics Company that still makes, I think, mostly basketball products now, weirdly enough, but they still make baseball and softball and a few other things. Uh, he founded that company, and he was uh, going to prove that baseball was a truly great American invention, that it had no European roots whatsoever. And he first decided they were going to do this massive world tour, and he got this group of all-stars together, and they went to South America and they played a few games. They went to the Caribbean and played a few games. There's really famous photos you can find of a baseball game in the desert under the shadow of the Great Pyramid of Giza. He organized that. They then went to Europe. And everywhere they went, they were just booed off the field. People hated it. Because <laughs> especially back then, baseball was slow. It was plodding. It was boring. You often hear the term, get baseball is a game of nerds. Baseball in 1860 was a game of nerds. And take that from a nerd. I, I, you know, I'm one. So he was just incensed, and he decided that he's going to prove that baseball was American. So he just made up this BS story of a Civil War hero inventing the game up in New York, a place he never even was at, a game he never even saw. Uh, the first actual recorded mention of baseball was in a 1791 newspaper in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And in particular, the newspaper, it was an ad taken out by the Council of Pittsfield saying that there was going to be in 1791 now, keep in mind, a $20 fine to anyone playing baseball within uh, so far of the town hall and its very expensive windows because too many of them were getting broken. So the kids were going to be fine. Well, the parents, more specifically, were going to be fined in 1791 if they didn't stop playing the game of base, as they called it. Baseball doesn't have a single inventor, but if it does, the closest one is actually Alexander Cartwright. But in actuality, it evolved from two very different games, both of which evolved from the English game of rounders. We, just, we basically ripped off rounders and made it baseball. And there is Alexander Cartwright's plaque in the Hall of Fame, if you ever go there. So what is rounders? It's, it's baseball. It's four bases. You have pitchers, you have batters, you score runs, you don't score goals. Um, you have posts, sort of like cricket wickets are the closest thing. You don't really have bases. Uh, and the interesting thing is there's no walks, there's no strikeouts. When uh, the pitcher delivers the ball, the umpire either calls good ball, bad ball. And if the umpire calls good ball, you have to swing. Uh, you get one pitch if it's a good ball, and that's it. This is still very popular in England, but with kids. It's a big uh, physical education game in primary school over in England. And that's why baseball never really took off over there, because they just view it as a kid's game, which is what it was. You then had town ball. Town ball became very popular in the United States after the Revolution going into the 19th century. Uh, Pennsylvania was very big in. New Jersey was very big in the... <laughs> Uh, even into New York State. Famously, Abe Lincoln claimed to play town ball. This is one of the many, many, many sports he claimed to play growing up. You have five bases, none of which are a safe haven, so you can't stay on base. Uh, you have to touch them, but they don't really give you any protection. And they actually formed a square, really more of a cube instead of a diamond. 
you had 11 men on each side and you played two eddings and you batted till everybody was out. So as long as you still had one man that was good, he just kept going around and around and around and around and batting. Uh, you either got a home run or you were out. <laughs> there was no in between. And, you know, you'd score 75, 85, 95, 100 runs if you were winning. And so that's a town ball bat on the bottom. See, it's a lot like the wiffle ball bats you could buy in the dollar store today. Really long, really thin. You're not going to hit for power with it. You're just trying to make contact and put the ball in play. The other game that baseball evolved from was what became known as the Massachusetts game. And this was a bizarre version of rounders and town ball. There were really no codified rules. If you Google the Massachusetts game, you'll get five, six, seven, eight different rule books. Uh, it had a square field. It actually had five bases because they considered the striker stand the fifth peg. And it still used the stand-up pegs like rounders did. It didn't use bases. There were no foul balls. It kind of like was cricket. If you hit the ball, it was in play wherever it was. Uh, you only got one out per inning. And crossouts were enforced. And crossouts is such a weird concept. Okay, let's say that I... Marianne is up to bat and she hits the ball and I'm already on base. If I run from first to second, all the, in let's say Marianne hits the ball back to the pitcher. All the pitcher has to do is turn around and throw the ball perpendicular to me. So if I'm running this way, all he has to do is throw the ball this way. No one has to catch it. It doesn't have to hit me and it doesn't have to go near the bag, but it crosses me out. And so I'm out. It's the dumbest rule I've ever heard of in my life, but that was a big thing. Uh, you had at least 10 men on a side, but you'll often read stories of 15 and 20 people on a side. Whole towns would come out on a Sunday to play the Massachusetts game. And because of this, because you only got one out and because you'd have so many people playing, uh, the captains would get together before the game and they would decide, hey, first team to score however many runs is going to win. And it usually was high, 25 or 30. So these games would take most of a day. So then, because of that, you had the formation of modern baseball. And like anything else, much like board games or even sports that we have today, people started to have house rules. They, you know, if they were playing the Massachusetts game, if they were playing town hall, they would start to work on their own rules. They would start to, uh, you know, tweak it a little bit. And these were clubs. These were gentlemen's clubs. That's why still officially baseball teams aren't teams. They're clubs, even to this day, because that's how it started. So the New York Gothams were one such group, and they were led by uh, Alexander Cartwright, who we talked about earlier, and by Doc Adams, who that's a picture of Doc Adams in the bottom there. This is actually the New York Gothams up in the top corner, but that's Doc Adams. Uh, if you're a fan of baseball, go online, sign the petition to put Doc Adams into the Hall of Fame. It's just a crisis that he's not in there. Uh, and so they wanted to make the game less of a child sport, less like rounders, and more of a proper gentleman's pastime, something that you could go and do on weekends and after work, and a nice hobby. So eventually, this set of rules sort of formed. It became known as the New York game, and then eventually baseball, which most people simply call base. Now, this is brutal to read on a screen. I understand that, but I, I only put this up for one reason. This is the Knickerbocker Club rules. This is it. This is the extent of the original rules of baseball. Just before I signed on today, I went on to MLB.com because the rule book, the current rule book, is available for free as a PDF. Just the actual game rules, not all the extra addendum and everything for COVID-19, just the actual game rules now are 189 pages. So in 150 years, we've gone from this to well over 200 pages with all the COVID rules. And really, this is even a misnomer because the first six or seven are actually rules for the Knickerbocker Club. This is how they decide club meetings. This is how they, you know, if someone shows up late to a meeting, what they do. So it's really only the last 14 or 15 that are actual rules. And... The vast majority of these, the Knickerbockers didn't invent these. The vast majority of these were played by other teams. However, the Knickerbockers were the first to put them all together. And they also were the first in two key dif differences. Number one is this one right here. It's very long and wordy, but you couldn't peg anyone. They invented the force out. 
because the thing that was keeping baseball from being a gentleman's game was someone would get pegged and would start a brawl. Baseball in the 1840s and the 1830s was like hockey. There were bench clearing brawls constantly. So the force out was designed to eliminate that. The other thing is right here, three outs per inning. Some people used seven, some people used 11, some people used one. The Knickerbockers came up with three and it stuck. And those were the two biggest changes they made to the game going forward. So by 1857, you have the National Association of Baseball Players. Like I said earlier, it was no, it wasn't made up of club or players. It was made up of clubs entirely within the New York City area. There also was one from Hoboken, New Jersey, which might as well be New York City. Uh, so it wasn't national, and it simultaneously was an attempt by the Knickerbockers to try to keep control of their game. They wanted everyone to play by the rule, their rules. They wanted to be able to control their rules. But at the same time, it was simultaneously an attempt by the rest of the New York teams to take control away. And it worked as a compromise, and they went back and forth. Uh, they added rules, most of which were created by Doc Adams, on the number of men per side, the number of eddings, the distance between the bases, um, all of that. They held their first national convention in 1860, which we talked about. And every year they would have their convention in December, because uh, much like here, there's not a lot to do in uh, New York City. So they would get together and they would sit around a hot stove and they would discuss the rules for the next year. And that became the yearly winter meetings that the owners still do to this day, all evolved uh, from the NABBP. Interestingly enough, both the Chicago Cubs and their original guys and the Cincinnati Reds were founding members of the NAB, well, not founding members, but early members of the NABBP. And they traced their lineage Hello. Cincinnati Reds in 1868, the very first professional team. So baseball's old. So okay, let's get to the rules. Uh, by 1816, as we said, very similar to our own, but there were still some uh, large differences that remained. The game was much higher scoring, and it was what we would consider technically faster, pace of play-wise, but it was all strategy. It was small ball. It was between the baselines. You weren't going to the outfield very much and you were never hitting home runs. So stealing, bunting, double switches, the squeeze play, all of that was in this time. Uh, so what's the same? You still have nine men on the side. You still have set batting orders. You still have four bases if you count home plate as a base. You had nine innings, although I have an asterisk there that we'll talk about. You couldn't plug. And you still had players and a manager. In the rule book today, you could still have a player manager, although I believe Pete Rose was the last one in the 80s. You can still legally do that. The captains at the time in the 1860s were the managers. They functioned as the manager. So here are some of the main differences. Rule number six, and this, this is all from 1860 from Beatles' Dime Ball Player. The ball has to be pitched. And so basically it's underhand. This is a, a pitcher from a modern vintage game. You could not throw overhand. In the founding baseball, the pitcher was the least important player on the team. Your worst player, you put at pitcher. Because all he was supposed to do was get the ball in play. That was it. And on top of that, when you would come up to bat, you would say whether you were a high ball man or a low ball man. And the pitcher was expected to deliver the ball where you wanted it. And it was incredibly unsporting to try to deceive the batter. Wildly different from the game today. Um, rule number eight is uh, about fair and foul. Basically, as long as it hit the ground before uh, the umpire called it foul, it was fair. So you only had one umpire at the time, and if you could distract him, if it landed, no matter where it landed, it technically was fair, which led to some interesting things, and they later changed that pretty quickly. Uh, rule number 10, if you uh, swung at three strikes uh, and it was dropped, much like today, you could run, only back then you had to run. It was a requirement. Uh, rule number 13 is interesting. It's the first bound rule. Uh, basically, if you caught a fly ball off of one hop, it was still an out. 
And this lasted until 1864 or 65, I have the exact date later on, and was highly contentious. This is actually from the 1860, from, uh, this was an article from uh, the coverage of the convention where they're just complaining about why do we have this first bound rule? These are supposed to be the best players in the world playing this game. They should be able to catch the ball on the fly and have it be an out. But it hung around. Uh, rule number 26 is the asterisks of uh, the nine innings rule. Basically, prior to 1860, you still had nine innings, but you had two sets of nine, sets innings. Of nine innings. Every team had a, uh, their first inning and their second inning. So this rule 26 sort of codified the top of the first and the bottom of the first, what we know now for the modern innings. Rule number 37 is interesting. Um, basically, if you were a batter, of course, there were no balls. And if you don't swing, there are no, uh, you know, really strike. There are no strikes. So you get to stand there all day. And after a while, the, the umpire would give you a warning. And then after a few more pitches, if you still weren't swinging at what he thought were good balls, he'd give you one strike. Then after a few more pitches, he'd give you two strikes. Then after a few more pitches, he'd finally give you three strikes. Um, most contemporary sources you read say that you got about 12 to 14 strikes before you finally were called out if you didn't swing at anything. Um, rule number 38 is interesting. They finally set it up so that a match was only one game instead of best two out of three. They tried it in uh, 1860. They hated it. In 1861, they went back to two out of three before finally settling on one game uh, a little bit later on, which is the way we play it today, of course. So, okay, the equipment, just like now. You have bats, you have balls, you have bases, you have the field. Um, this is a photo of my stuff. I included this so it's a little bit easier for you guys to see since we're not in person. Uh, the field, you know, by 1860, it wasn't 90 feet between the bases. This is a very early crude drawing of a, of a diamond. You had no real set parameters for the longest time until Doc Adams stepped in. You also had the early keyhole design for the mound, which you could see on the bottom the right-hand corner there. You're supposed to have a little walkway to the mound so you don't walk on the grass. Most of the time, you played in a field. That's why still to this day, a lot of baseball parks are called fields. So the captains would get together and they would set ground rules. And these were very important because these could end in a match ending prematurely or ending in a forfeit. If a team hit the ball and it went into, say, you know, some rose bushes or some woods off to the side and the player was in, players weren't able to find the ball, umpire would call time, usually give the home team 15 to 20 minutes to find the ball because you only had one. It's not like it is today. And if the ball was unable to be found, the match could be a forfeit or at the very least a draw. So ground rules were very, very important. You know, if this ball goes over here, uh, today, you know, it's a ground rule double. If this ball goes over here, it's an out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, most of the 100, not most of, but a lot of the 189 pages, maybe 25, 30 pages of the current rule book is ground rules for different fields. Uh, Tropicana Field in Tampa Bay has quite a few because it's a dome and you have the walkways and you have the overhangs. But ground rules are still around today. So bats, this was the entirety of the 1860 rule book. The bat must be round and must not exceed two and a half inches in diameter and its thickest part. It must be made of wood and may be of any length to suit the striker. You could show up with a 60 inch bat <laughs> and people did. <laughs> it led to a few pitchers getting blasted in the face and severely injured for them later on to finally put limits on uh, what they considered to be wood and then the size and the length and the weight. But you had some monster bats going forward. Uh, the ball, this is my early ball. I know it's very difficult to see, uh, but they were all handmade and they're incredibly soft. I mean, I'm actually, it's squeezed. It's like one of those stress balls here. They have a hard cork center in them, but the rest of it is just stuffing with leather. And so because of that, it's dead. It's almost impossible to hit this for power. I could throw you a softball and I mean, you're gonna get all of it and it's just not gonna go anywhere. Uh, the, you only had one ball per game. You used it until you lost it or it fell apart. I've got at least four or five complete games on this one. That's why it's all misshapen, and dirty and ripped. It's got maybe another one or two in it. 
So you would just keep using it. Um, because of this, because you couldn't hit it for power, this led to the creation of what they called the inside game. You had the Baltimore chop where you try to hit the ball down and spike it to make the, the, the fair or foul rule. A lot of stealing, a lot of bunting, a lot of squeeze plays. You wanted to be fast between the foul lines because you weren't going to really make it to the outfield. Uh, I couldn't bring my bases today, so I have that really bad picture. You'll have to forgive that. Uh, they're just cloth or canvas bags, and you fill them with either sand or sawdust. And if you notice the strap, that was what they called the sliding strap or the sliding belt. And even in baseball today, when someone slides head first, you try to go around the bag and then hook it with your arm. They call it a hook slide. That was the only way people were sliding back then. Spiking didn't come to later on until Ty Cobb and the turn of the century and all that. But around the Civil War era, everything was head first, and you tried to put your arm through the strap because the bases then weren't tied down. So you hook the bag and take it with you as you slid across the field, and that way you weren't out. Uh, home plate was just a metal disc. It literally was a plate, uh, the way we think of a dinner plate. And then the pitcher's mound was just a square little, imagine the pitcher's rubber today, but completely flat, no mound, and made of metal. So the glove, everybody loves the gloves. In 18, by 1860, nobody wore a glove. However, the late 1860s, 1867, 1868, the earliest gloves uh, showed up on catchers. And these were purely for protection. Even this thing, this is a mid 1870s design. It's very hard to see, but you have a huge amount of stuffing right here. You have a huge amount of stuffing right here. And it's great if I wanted a spark, if we were going to box, I could catch your punches all day, but to catch things, it's pretty much useless. Uh, so much so that if you read journals and everything, the idea was you would knock the ball down, try to pick it up on the first bound, and then come up and be ready to throw. It just basically was for protection. You put your hand in front of your face. So because of that, uh, the earliest fielder gloves were dyed pink, or they were dyed flesh-colored. That way in the stands, no one could see you were wearing them, because you would be heckled mercilessly. If you showed up with a glove, look at that sissy over there. He doesn't want to get his hands broken. You know, what does he think he is? Um, Bid McPhee, who played with the Reds, made it all the way to the National League. He uh, played in a World Series gloveless. He played until 1891. There's a picture of him. He was the shortstop with no glove and, uh, you know, reaching down to catch a ball. Interestingly enough, the earliest gloves you could wear on either hand, either your catching hand or your throwing hand. I had this one made for my catching hand just because I'm, I'm more used to it. But you could have either or. Some players wore two. Not many, but some players wore two. Uh, this is an early Albert Goodwood Spalding ad for baseball gloves. He jumped on that as well. A few other significant dates. 1859, you had the first NCAA game. Of course, it wasn't the NCAA back then between Williams and Amherst. It wasn't until 1864 that balls and walks were introduced. 1865, finally, the first bound rule came out. 1868 was the first professional team, the Reds, which we talked about. 1876, the National League was formed, and curveballs were finally allowed. But I have an asterisk in there, because even though they were allowed, they were still considered unsporting well after this. So much so that in the mid-1880s, Harvard won the national championship and forfeited the title, because their starting pitcher was a curveball pitcher, and that was not the Harvard way, darn it. So we're just going to give up the title because that's unsporting. It wasn't until 1884 that overhand pitching was finally legalized. Up until then, you had to have sort of a submarine or a sidearm uh, delivery, and it became too hard to uh, <laughs> leave, so they finally made it legal in 1884. You also had the first World Series. Now, this is interesting because these are, are sort of blacklisted in the MLB. Because you had the early American Association, which was the precursor of the American League. I always like it because it's referred to in the newspapers uh, divisively as the Beer and Whiskey League. Because they actually sold liquor at their games, heaven forbid. Uh, but they showed up and they played uh, off and on a few sets of World Series. And the American League doesn't recognize any of them. The National League only recognizes the ones they won. And there's a few of them that they just gave up halfway through and were like, this is stupid and nobody won. So they're different. Uh, 1901, the American League, as we know it, was formed. Now, of course, 2020, we have universal DH because of COVID-19 and possibly going forward. 
And there's been a lot of hand wringing over this. There's been a lot of hand wringing over it since the 70s when it came in. In 1906, Connie Mack, of all people, drew up what basically reads as the modern designated hitter rule because the pitchers in the early 1900s were so bad at hitting even back then. So I've never understood this, oh, pitchers used to always bat. Yeah, but they never were good at it. The minute overhand pitching was legalized, they became specialized. Uh, 1919, of course, you had the Black Sox scandal. Which uh, 1917, that World Series was also fixed. Uh, we can finally admit that now, but the Giants never got caught, so nobody really talks about that. But you had two completely fixed World Series within three years. In 1920, the spitball was outlawed after a gentleman from Cleveland was killed when he got hit in the head. Uh, 1921, you have the modern glove design, modern in that it has a web from Rawlings. And then it wasn't until 1934, think about this one, it wasn't until 1934 that the National League and the American League finally agreed to use the same ball. That one always blows my mind. <laughs> they were using two different balls until then. So here's some additional reading for you guys. And uh, Marianne has the slideshow. I have the slideshow. We can email it to anybody who wants. Uh, you know, the, the 1845 rules, the 1860 rule book. And uh, Beatles Dime Paul player is interesting because not only does it have the rule book, it also has some tips on how to play different positions at the time. So it's kind of fun to see because shortstop was technically an outfield position at the time. Um, and then you have Haney's baseball reference a little bit later on. So that's that. This is a little bit shorter than it normally is because we, you know, some of the more hands on stuff we obviously can't do because of 2020. But if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. That might be a good Did one. the American League and the National League use the same size ball? Uh, not until 1934. No, the, the National League, from what I understand, was a little smaller, slightly smaller. So what would they do in the World Series? That I don't know. And I've, look, I've actually had that question before, and I looked it up, and I cannot find a definitive answer. I believe the home team provided the balls. So I believe whoever was the home team for that game, you used that ball. Because that was actually the rule going forward, the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. The home team was always responsible for the ball. And then the winning team kept it. That was actually in the 1860 uh, Beatles dime ball player. And that's where we get the whole idea of a game ball. If you beat the home team, you got to keep their ball, which could get expensive if you were a bad team. Uh, but I don't know definitively uh, for sure that's what they did, but I believe the home team had to specify. Hmm. Thank you. Mark, where do you get your equipment? Do you make your own or you have somebody that makes them for you? There are a few places online um, if you, because this is actually becoming more and more of a hobby. Uh, if you just type in vintage baseball equipment, you'll get uh, a bunch of them. 19th century baseball is the biggest one. Uh, they made uh, my bat. They made the ball, my bases, the glove. It actually was a lady I found on Etsy. And you give her all of your measurements. And it takes a little while because it's all handmade. It's all hand stitched, but she cuts the leather and she sews it together and she puts the padding in and the whole nine yards. And I mean, I mean, if I could, you could punch this all day. I'll never feel it. <laughs> no matter how hard you throw a punch, I'll never feel it. But the stuff is out there. It's not super expensive. Um, it's more expensive than traditional baseball equipment, but it's not difficult to obtain. And I know with COVID, you're probably not playing that much, but are you a member of a certain team? And where would you play if you were playing right now? I'm not a member of a club officially. Uh, I joined the VBBA when we started doing this uh, because we – when we were doing more reenactments, we had different units. We would play games at night because that is how baseball <laughs> was in the country, especially down south, was we taught Confederate prisoners how to play baseball in the prison camps. So we would reenact that. Plus, it's just fun to play baseball when you have a bunch of guys. Uh, but we usually play at Sweatland because we have a decent sized field but at the same time there are trees and there are obstacles so if you have a crowd you can explain about needing to set ground rules you can explain what the ground rules are um, you could be a little bit more in depth right. and then you know we would basically make teams with whoever was there usually it was union versus confederate although if we had two union units you know, we might pick teams 
Uh, it bounced back and forth. But we tried to do two to three games a year. And we actually had people come out and watch, which was kind of cool. And, you know, because you can follow along uh, with it if you know what's going on. Any other questions for Mark? Mark, when did what was that, Wes? You broke up. Sorry, when was the Negro League started? The Negro League was in the 20th century. I don't know the exact year. See, that's one of the things that I don't want to say gets me mad, but it, Major League Baseball likes to forget their history in a lot of cases. We talked about the first set of World Series. They hold up Jackie Robinson as breaking the color barrier. And yes, it's true. He broke the modern color barrier. But in the 19th century, while uncommon, it was not unheard of for lighter-skinned African-Americans, lighter-skinned Cuban-Americans, and uh, mixed-race individuals to play. It wasn't really until the 1890s that finally the Gentleman's Agreement, as we know it, took place. I want to say off the top of my head, it was the late teens, early 20s, the first Negro League was formed, because there was a, a few of them before the Negro Leagues as we traditionally think of them with the Kansas City Monarchs and, and those teams before they took off. There was a few attempts beforehand. And I want to say it was right around World War I off the top of my head, but I don't know for sure. I know um, I heard of one that was actually started in Wilkesbury somewhere, but I haven't really been able to pinpoint it or find any reference material to it. Uh, that's, I can absolutely believe that because we had so, so many baseball, I mean, every community had teams, but Wilkesbury especially had so many and so many leagues. Scranton had so many and so many leagues. Pittston, um, even I did uh, an, a more expanded version of this talk for the Whitehaven Community Library maybe two years ago. And a bunch of older gentlemen, probably in their late 80s, early 90s, showed up in their uniforms from their team the Whitehaven Aces, which was really cool. Um, and traditionally, locally, we've had much more success with baseball as a professional sport than we have with football, for example. Um, you know, the, the Wilkesbury Barons is a common name both for baseball, but there also was a professional football team which was playing adjacent to the NFL in the 30s and didn't win a single game. So we've had traditionally more success with baseball, both from a winning perspective and also from a fan perspective. So it wouldn't surprise me in the least that there was a, an attempt at a Negro League around here because there'd be money to be made. People would pay to see it. Um, that's how the, the story of Babe Ruth's home run started at Artillery Park. It was a barnstorming game. You know, they got an all-star team together to play the local guys. Depending on what story you believe, the promoter said to the pitcher, hey, all these people want to see Babe Ruth hit a home run. Give him a softy. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and it still hasn't landed yet. Um, you know, so uh, there was a lot of money to be made. And, and people wanted to see it. People legitimately liked baseball. Um, it wasn't until the late 50s and the quote-unquote greatest game ever played uh, between the Colts and I forget who the other team was. New York Giants. Yes, Giants, before football finally overtook baseball. But up until then, it was the national pastime. I Mark. heard it was really big in this area. Yes. Every school, every church, every everybody had a baseball league. Every union. Every union. You look at photos, you have bankers teams, you have teams of brewers, you have teams of uh, pipe fitters and boilermakers all the way through the 60s. Every group had a team. A lot of coal collieries had teams too. Yeah. Pete, were you going to say something? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, a few years ago, my wife and I and my daughter went down to South Orange, New Jersey, and we went to a place called Cameron Fields. And there was a, a full game played between Flemington and the South Orange Villagers, and they were uh, they played under 1864 rules, and it was pretty cool because they had uniforms. The umpire was in a Lincoln-style uh, top hat, and he stood to the side, 
And a gentleman <clears throat> before before the games got started, a gentleman recited Casey at the bat. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you can have a, a lot of fun with those. Um, the you know the hardcore ones. You don't do the national anthem before the game because they, you didn't back then. That wasn't a thing till till later on. Um, and unless it's early 19th century or 20th century rather, early 1900s, you don't do the seventh inning stretch because William Howard Taft inadvertently started that. He went to a game with the Senators at the time, the Washington Senators, and he was bored. It was a blowout. So halfway through the seventh, he got up to leave. Well, when the president stands up, everybody stands up. <laughs> and so he got caught, and that was how the seventh inning stretch started. So, no, it's – there are a lot – those high-end ones, like I never have a uniform. Uh, I would wear my period clothing because – you know, the clubs, we talked about it a little bit, but it was an after work type of thing. You would show up, you would practice, you'd play your games. So you would wear your clothes after work and men wore collared shirts with detachable collars and vests and sleeves. And you don't see that as much anymore. I mean, I know the Diamondbacks still wear a vest. I think the Rockies still have the vest, um, but that's where the, you know, the true uniform started. So we wear that, but if you see some of these leagues where everybody has the, the stovepipe cap with the three lines, oh, it's it's fantastic. It, it's you really can go back. You know, I don't no, know. You probably didn't know this. Lots of games on YouTube. What was that, George? No, um, you know, because I <laughs> most of my studies are, are going towards streetcars, but both Philadelphia. And out here where I live now in Pittsburgh, you know, where they had a great number of car bars, places where they stored the streetcars. And I've seen documentation of the teams for each of those car bars. And they would play each other and the neighborhood would come out to watch these car bar teams play each other. Now, I don't know whether, uh, you know, Scranton or Wilkesboro, I haven't seen documentation yet to see whether they you know, played Gibbons beer or whatever, but I, I don't know. But the big systems had had their own teams. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, yeah. the Dodgers, of course, are the trolley Dodgers. Because all yeah, their crazy fans call the trolley Dodgers. Dodgers yeah. On the streetcars. So, you know, it's – it really was – while it came from rounders, while we did kind of rip it off from the English, by World War One, it is a distinctly American thing. We, we Like everything else we steal, we put our own little twist on it. And it's really kind of fun to look at the evolution of it in that, yeah, okay, you can see the lineage, but no, this is kind of something new. So I guess Albert Spaulding got his wish after all, even though it wasn't the way he wanted it. But Any other questions? Well, thank you, Mark. That was very interesting. I know I learned a lot because I don't know much about baseball. Um, and uh, someday maybe we'll get to watch a, a reenactment game. I think that would be a lot of fun to see Marion applauding. So we're all applauding for you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, we're going to take Halloween weekend off because if you know me, you know I'll be busy. Um, but on November 4th, we will be welcoming John Fielding the curator from the Anthracite Heritage Museum. Mark probably knows John well. He'll be talking John, about <laughs> Anthracite photographers. So uh, if you haven't seen the exhibit at the Anthracite Museum, this will be a nice way to enjoy it virtually. Yeah. Um, so I hope to see everyone on November 4th at 2 p.m. Again, thank you for coming. Please stay safe and stay in tune with the Historical Society. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Mm -hmm.